and welcome to my channel. I am Mary and I just got back from a week in Iceland in June and I wanted to share some uh, tips and tricks and advice for people who are in maybe my age, weight and height demographic uh, who might be wanting to travel to Iceland. Iceland is a beautiful country. It is about the size of Kentucky and it, they only have, I think, 3,300,000 3, or 300,000 people, something like that. So really about the half the size of Baltimore, which is where I'm from. And so not a lot of people, a whole lot of space, mostly populated around the coastal area of the, of the country. But I wanted to give some advice for people who are maybe a little bit like me because there are a lot of videos out there on the internet and on YouTube where you see pretty fit, pretty young uh, kids and younger people who are hiking Iceland. And um, I am not that. I am 58 years old, I'm five foot three, and I weigh close to 280 pounds. So I am not skinny, not really in the greatest of shape. I have a really sedentary job. And I wanted to share just some ways that you can really enjoy Iceland without really wiping yourself out. Now, that said, when we got back from Iceland, I logged my miles and it looked like I had walked 45 miles over six consecutive days. And that's a lot in, I mean, maybe not a lot for you, but it was a lot for me. So I wanted to just give a little bit of advice to people who maybe are a little bit like me, who want to experience the beauty and the brutality of the extreme climate of Iceland and um, not kill themselves. So here we go. The first thing I wanna advise you to do is to research where you plan to go in Iceland. There are so many places that you can go. You can, you can just stay in the city, you can travel around. There's a lot. We rented a car. I went with my son who's 32 and he's in a little bit better shape than I am, certainly. And, um, but he's also recovering from a motorcycle accident. So he had a little bit of limited mobility in his foot. Um, we really researched where we could go and the types of hiking and walking and trails and things that we wanted to participate in. There are a lot of really nice places that you can see in Iceland, but some of them require, I would say, a moderate to high level uh, skill set in hiking in order to access them. There are a lot of other tourist attractions that have well-maintained paths and even sort of this um, rubberized matting that goes over some of the gravel pathways to kind of contain the gravel, I suppose, from washing away, but also just to make the footing a little bit uh, better. And there's a lot, a lot of places that have almost like wooden boardwalks that you might find at the beach or someplace like that. So um, even if you are handicapped, you could probably access some of the attractions in Iceland. And I think that they do a pretty good job of explaining that in, uh, as you're looking at the different sites, it, it explains how accessible those paths are. But sometimes when you get there, there's just, you know, a path that you could take that's a lot more treacherous than maybe you're comfortable with. So I wanted to make sure that you do your research. Also, consider the order of your sightseeing. So one of the things that we did that I would have done differently is that the last day of our trip, we actually went to the National Museum of Iceland. And this is a great museum which tells about the history of the country and gives you sort of the background on some of these historic landmarks that we saw during the week, but we didn't see that until the end. Now, when you're at these historic landmarks and you're at these sites, there are plenty of plaques that explain what's going on there, but I think it would have been nice to have had that sort of um, overview and that the museum um, provides. And I'm gonna give a link to all the different places that we went and stopped in the bottom of this video, just so you can get an idea of where um, might be good places for you to go. So after you have researched where you wanna go and you've kind of got an overview of what sorts of places are the most accessible to you, and you've sort of sketched out the order that you wanna do the sightseeing, you should really start training. 
And I, what I mean by training is I literally mean going to the gym. So I should have done this a little bit earlier, but about six weeks before we left on our trip, I started going to the gym every day and working out. And I'm talking 45 minutes, solid, brisk walking on a treadmill, plus some different types of strength training exercises. The REI website and other websites have exercises that you can do to strengthen your legs for hiking. And I cannot stress this enough in that you need to train for the kind of environments that you're going to encounter in Iceland. The amount of walking that you will do, even within the city, is going to require a bit of training if you're not used to it. And I really just am not used to it. If you're in better shape, it won't be such an issue, but it's always wise to do this because it'll, you'll avoid injury. What your training involves is entirely up to you, but for me, it included 45 minutes on the treadmill, solid, no breaks, and it included the strength training for my ankles, for my legs, my thighs, my calves, um, and it also included just sort of an overall mental, putting myself in the mental state of that I was going to be walking a lot and I needed to get my cardio and my strength training up to the up to par so that when I got there I wouldn't be just like breathless all the time and I'm generally not necessarily breathless but again you cannot over prepare for this kind of environment I need to also stress that Iceland you know it is a beautiful country but it is a very brutal and extreme country I almost like when I was there I almost thought like how did people settle this country it is really very extreme the beaches are harsh and they'll destroy your ships um, the wind is crazy it's fast it rains a lot even in the summertime it's cold it's colder than you expect it to be we went in June and that's not the warmest month I think July and August are probably warmer but it was only 63 degrees I think that was the highest we experienced 63 degrees Fahrenheit and lows of around lows in the 40s and one of the days that we were there the high was only 44 and it, I felt like I was on that show the deadliest catch I was wearing a raincoat and just I was drenched you know it was it was crazy but it was beautiful but also brutal so you have to be prepared that this is not a cushy kind of holiday this is an extreme kind of holiday but I enjoyed it a lot Okay, so now that you've researched the places that you want to go and you've kind of figured out the order that you want to visit them and you've trained or you are training, you should start selecting your wardrobe to fit the weather for the time that you're going to be there. And if you're going in summer, I recommend doing layers, wearing layers. And cotton is not actually the best layer, is not actually the best base layer for you. Merino wool is actually the best base layer. So if you can get t-shirts and long sleeve shirts in a light merino wool, then you can layer heavier things on top of that. I actually can't say enough good things about merino wool. You'd think wool would be hot in the summertime, but it's not. It's It keeps you comfortable just like it would keep a sheep comfortable. And there are plenty of sheep in Iceland. Once you have your base layer figured out, you can put anything on top of that, like a puffer jacket or one of these nice handmade Lopa Pesas from the Hand Knitting Association of Iceland, which I spent way too much money on, but it's definitely worth it. And this, these things are warm, they're waterproof, and they last forever. So I highly recommend getting one of those while you're there, but be prepared to pack it back because they're very bulky and you'll need something extra to squish it down so it'll fit in your suitcase. The last thing that you want to make sure that you bring uh, in your wardrobe are waterproof, rainproof gear. So I had a, um, a rain jacket with a hood and I also had uh, rain pants and you don't want to bring an umbrella or anything because the winds are too strong for that and they'll just it's just a waste so the but the rain jacket and the rain pants are great because there are opportunities for you to be near and walk behind waterfalls where you will get drenched 
the wind can pick up during a rainstorm and the rain will be going sideways and you will be wet. Uh, you want to make sure that whatever you're wearing is also uh, dries quickly. So, for example, I brought a pair of nylon pants. They were thick. They, they weren't see-through or anything, but they were thick and they dried very quickly if they got wet. And they were also cool uh, if it was a little bit warmer. I also had a pair of merino wool uh, leggings, which were great. And I wore some silk um, long johns under those to for an extra bit of uh, warmth. And then you have the rain pants that can slip over top of those and it's perfect because it's miserable being wet if you're stuck in Iceland and your clothing and your shoes and everything are wet. Speaking of shoes, hiking boots are extremely important. I would not recommend going to Iceland and just wearing your sneakers or your Converse or whatever or just some flats or boots or whatever. Do not wear regular shoes. They will be destroyed. Get yourself some high quality hiking boots. I bought myself a pair of Merrell hiking boots and I really like them. They were uh, kind of a lower cost, but they're waterproof and they have provide enough support. They're I actually got hiking shoes, not hiking boots, excuse me. And um, they're, they were great. They were they provided enough protection for my feet against the rocks and the gravel and the things that you're walking over. And I was able to wear them in the city and in the country. And people in Reykjavik don't expect you to be dressed up. I mean, unless you're really going to some sort of fancy restaurant, which I didn't even find. I guess there's one there, but I didn't even have an opportunity to go to something like that there. But everything that we went to was very nice in the city and they did not question your clothing. I mean, they just totally expect people to be wearing sweaters and comfortable shoes, hiking shoes and hiking pants and things like that, even in um, a high-end restaurant. So get yourself a pair of uh, very well-made uh, quality hiking shoes or hiking boots and do a little bit of research on those. I got mine from REI. Another thing that I picked up from REI, and this isn't a commercial for, for or REI at all, it's just that I happen to be a member and so I, I get some stuff from, from there, were trekking poles. Now, you maybe think of trekking poles as something that you might need for extreme hiking. Well, if you're not in shape and you need a little extra support, or if you're a little bit unstable in your feet, like I sometimes am, because I have some joint issues with my hips and things like that, the trekking poles were great and really all they are are walking sticks but they uh, collapse and they fit inside my small carry-on suitcase so I was able to bring the uh, trekking poles I had two sometimes I used just one sometimes I used two and it was just that little bit of extra stability that I needed for some of the paths and trails and it it actually just makes you go a little bit faster and gives you a little bit more stability as with most travels, you'll want to make sure that you bring a hat, um, a good pair of sunglasses, and sunscreen. There's nothing like getting a sunburn, even on a 63 degree day in Reykjavik, to ruin your day. When you're hiking through Iceland, or anywhere really, you want to make sure that you bring enough water. Um, you don't need bottled water in Iceland. They have plenty of beautiful, pure glacier water that comes right out of the tap. So just bring yourself a refillable uh, container. I had like a one and a half liter container that I got from Tupperware that I brought with me and I refilled that at every opportunity. Keep yourself hydrated and uh, eat high protein snacks. One of the funniest high protein snacks that we came across. I wouldn't say maybe not, maybe not funny, but just something that um, smelled up the entire car was the dried fish. And my son really liked it. And But to me, it had the texture of something like fiberglass or like some sort of filling or I don't know. It was very fibrous. But just imagine taking a fish and drying the fish and then rolling it flat and salting it a little bit. And that, it was basically beef jerky, but a fish. And it was delicious, but it wasn't like, I mean, just the texture of it was a little weird for me. So I didn't really get into that too much, but that's a high protein snack that you could bring along. Make sure you've got food in the car. Um, that's another thing, we rented a car and I would strongly suggest that if you rent a car that you get the zero liability insurance 
because anything can happen to your car. You can get into a wind, a sandstorm and your car can be pitted. You can break a window really easily. The roads there are very narrow and twisty turny and it's not really, it's not hard to imagine how easy it would be to go off the embankment of one of those roads because none of them have guardrails. And it, yeah, <laughs> it was it was kind of scary at times. Be prepared. If you're driving around Iceland, uh, you are going to encounter some interesting road situations. Um, get a four by four, you, even if you don't think you're gonna be um, going anywhere, even if you don't expect the, the roads to be um, uh, lower conditions, you may run into it. And it's not like you'll be off-roading with a 4x4. It's just that sometimes you need the 4x4 for the gravel or the pitted roads or whatever that you might encounter. I just have a couple of more uh, words of advice for planning a trip to Iceland. First of all, just don't overplan. You're not going to be able to do as much as you think you're going to do in one day. There's a little bit of driving involved. There's a lot of walking involved. And even if you're the type of person who maybe walks your neighborhood a mile or two or more a, a day, walking on hiking trails is different. And walking in these extreme conditions is different. So just prepare yourself that it's going to be a little bit harder than you might expect. And you're gonna get tired. So don't over plan. I, we did a lot of stops along in Western Iceland. Um, it's worth it to go back and maybe do two or three more trips to Iceland if you want to see the whole whole thing or spend more time and do the whole ring road but we didn't we weren't there for that so um, don't ever plan and also know when to quit I mean there were a couple paths where my son forged ahead and I decided I was done I was it wasn't that I was tired but I was a little concerned about the condition of the trail and he told me there was one there was one path through a ravine where you could, I mean, the end result that you got when you got to the ravine was really beautiful. And I saw the pictures he took, but he said it, you had to climb over rocks and I was just not prepared for that. So I'm just not in that kind of condition. So um, when you're planning your trip to Iceland, I would recommend, um, you know, taking these steps that I've mentioned, do some research, figure out what you wanna do, train, physically train yourself to go. Um, get your wardrobe in order, figure out what the weather's going to be what, like when you're there, get some really good quality hiking boots or hiking shoes, um, invest in some, in some trekking poles if you think you need them. I, I absolutely did need them and, and, and appreciated having them. And then, you know, prepare yourself, set your expectations and have a great time. If you want more information about Iceland, I would recommend that you follow the channel All About Iceland where um, the woman there, Jules, has tons and tons of uh, suggestions of places to go and advice to of things to see and things about the culture. And I really appreciated her videos and watched a lot of them before um, I took my trip. So um, I, thanks for listening. And I'm going to sign off now for, for this. Um, I'm not a travel channel, so don't expect to see a whole lot of other videos like this, but it was something that I thought I would share with folks because uh, I really felt like this trip was um, sort of the pinnacle of my travel adventures so far in terms of uh, the physical demands that it required of me. And I appreciated that because I, like I said, I don't have a very physical job. I'm very sedentary. I don't have a lot of physical stressors in my life. And so in order for, I mean, for me to do this, I felt I was actually very proud of myself for doing this trip, and um, I couldn't have, I couldn't have done it without my son Sam, and he was uh, instrumental in urging me to go further and farther than I probably would have gone, and he drove the entire way, and we didn't go off a cliff. So thanks for watching. Bye bye.